Tonight on Inside Story. She is beautiful. The cold-blooded killers who deceived us all. I don't believe it. You knew something had happened. Barefaced liars who stood before the world. I haven't harmed my wife or my daughter. And tried to get away with murder. A complete animal. We've got a police on the way. Find out what makes them tick. A true psychopath really enjoys the attention. As soon as it goes, bitch, that's fing me there. They just carried on like normal life. How the experts can read their minds. Right there, that's a, a major red flag. And how far they'll go to cover their crimes. In a meeting, what do I do? How could someone be so cold before it all comes crashing down? Pop it off, tears. I'm Layla McKinnon. Welcome to Inside Story. A child is missing. The distraught parents go on television and beg for her safe return. A woman's murdered. Her husband makes an emotional plea for help in finding the killer. Are they for real or are they just crocodile tears? Well, tonight we'll show you how to tell the difference, how to unmask a murderer. Let someone know you're all right, please. Just call someone and just say you're okay. Anyone. It's not any, any information at all. We shared their pain. We're really worried about you, your family. Everyone's worried. The grieving son. Besides being my hero and role model, he was my mentor. The desperate dad. I'm speaking today to make a national appeal to Anna. The distraught mum. She is beautiful. <laughs> but their tears are crocodile tears. It's all an act. These people are heartless killers. Do you want to see now? Can they please go to the police? <laughs> and none more so than Christy Abrahams and her partner, Rob Smith. Just hope that she's found as soon as possible. That's what we need. Safe and well. The pair has already killed Christie's little daughter, Kaisha. And now they're trying to get away with murder. What kind of things were Christie and Rob doing that didn't seem true to you? Not looking up at the cameras or even he couldn't even look at the camera and she couldn't take the tissue away f from her mouth when she was talking. You knew something had, had happened. Tonight, our experts take you into the lives of these deceitful killers. Right there. We'll reveal the telltale signs to their terrible crimes. We'd like to ask anyone out there to please help us. And we'll delve into the troubled minds of these crying killers to discover just what's behind these shameless displays of grief. And we can't express our gratitude to everybody that's been concerned with the case of what's been going on. For most of us, that's the most perplexing thing about these troubling cases. How could someone be so cold, so calculating, that they would not only lie about murdering a loved one, but do it so publicly for all the world to see? The main motivation for these killers putting on these public appeals is obviously to avoid punishment. They think if they can divert suspicion from themselves by showing how devastated they are that they'll get away with it. They're quite manipulative and they think that they can control the investigation by, by talking to the media. Leah Geritano is a clinical psychologist. Do they enjoy the attention? Some of them do. So a true psychopath really enjoys the attention because they, they have very little stimulation. They stimulation seek. And other people want to play the victim or have victim status and um, they enjoy the sympathy. And so this um, outcry of emotion for them makes them feel like they're someone, a celebrity or, or important. Nobody typifies that delusional self-belief more than Seth Gonzalez. They're not breathing, what do I do? They're both being shot, are they? <laughs> I know this is out of luck. In 2001, the university student coldly, methodically bashes and stabs to death his sister, his mother and his father in their northern Sydney home and then tries to divert suspicion by spray painting racist slogans on the walls. Most of you are probably aware of the 
tragedy that my family has experienced this week. It's a lie, he continues again and again, the deception becoming ever more extraordinary and grotesque. Sorry, I never told you All I wanted to say He thinks he's smarter than the police, he thinks he's smarter than the public and, and, and he's going to succeed. He's a narcissistic person and he believes that he's masterminded this whole, you know, perfect crime. As you'll see tonight, it's often the most seemingly ordinary people who make these unbelievably callous and calculating appeals. I'm speaking today to make a national appeal. People like former bank clerk John Sharp. In 2004, he murders his pregnant wife Anna in the most horrific way, firing a spear gun into her head twice. He then concocts an elaborate lie, claiming she's left him for another man. Anyone who knows the whereabouts of Anna, please contact the police. But that's not the worst of it. As he plays the distraught husband, Sharp is hiding the fact he's also killed his baby daughter Gracie with that same spear gun. My biggest fear is being denied part of Gracie's future. What I'm not seeing is the emotion in the right place. Steve Van Apperen is a behavioural analyst, an expert in detecting deception, studying what people say, how they say it and how they act. Sadness and grief is the most difficult uh, human emotion to replicate on our face uh, because a number of muscles take play, uh, combine and uh, we don't see that. Did you kill your wife, Anna? I haven't harmed my wife or my daughter. I haven't harmed either of them. How likely is it that you're going to be able to act as if you were innocent, if you did have something to do with... You know what I say? I say you can try. You can try to act, but at the end of the day, you're going to stumble. And no one stumbles so publicly, so spectacularly, as Mick Philpot. For the camera, he's the grieving father, a dad who's lost six of his children in a ferocious house fire. <laughs> But it's Philpot who started the fire, and now he's trying to hide the terrible crime. I've actually been down to my our, our home, and what we saw, we just, we just kept on. <laughs> his heartless deceit culminates in this extraordinary appeal with his wife Mairead by his side. But the one thing I would request is please, please leave my family alone. But, as we'll see later, not everyone is fooled. What I saw there was, was a guy who was sat there pretending to cry, and I've described it as a, as a bit of a sham of a performance. It's just too overwhelming. It was a big circus for him, and he was the guy in control. And he has no guilt or shame, so it's very, very easy for him to lie without any of the, the fear or the concern that most of us would have. Coming up next... <laughs> Right there. What really happened to little Kaisha Whippet? Why'd she have to kill Kaisha? I'm watching. Huh? I'm watching. <laughs> Six year old Kaisha Whippet, the cute little girl with the big smile. Our hearts go out to her family when she's reported missing by her seemingly grief-stricken parents. Someone must know something. Please come forward. But right from the start, many close to the family have their suspicions about Kaisha's mother, Christy Abrahams, and stepdad, Rob Smith. Do you want to see her? Can I please contact the police? No, just crocodile's tears. Why didn't it look like she was really upset? Just the eyes and the tissues over the mouth and no, it just didn't seem right. Hi, I'm 
I'm, I've just got nothing. I went to the toilet. Every night I set my front door was open and my daughter's not here. The couple's calculated charade begins three weeks after they kill Kaisha. Abrahams makes a triple zero call reporting her missing. How old is your daughter? She's six. Have you checked all the units? No, 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 I've just gotten up. What was really interesting, she wasn't offering a lot of information. The operator was asking questions, so it sounded um, very, um, almost not laid back, but it, it, there wasn't that degree of emergency. Abrahams carries on lying to the operator for almost five minutes. She's not here. I'm everywhere. Now, Tracy, we have got everybody on their way out there. Yeah. Yes, she was sobbing, but she was very passive and she wasn't offering a lot of information about the abduction other than what the operator uh, asked her. I expect heartfelt emotion, frantic, panic, uh, concern, worry, safety. Mm. I don't see it. On the day, I didn't see Christy upset once. Friend Kylie Marshall is one of the first to comfort Kaisha's family. She wasn't crying. She seemed a little bit upset but she wasn't crying and she just said I just want to go home. But at the time you thought maybe they were in shock or? Just, I just thought there was a, a couple of little things that sort of seemed a bit odd to me but I, then I just thought maybe this is just their way of, of dealing with it. It's now two days since Christy Abraham's triple zero call reporting Kaisha's disappearance. You want to see her? Can they please call to the police? And the lies continue with a public appeal for Kaisha's safe return. She was beautiful. It's interesting because she's made no comment at all. Um, and her face is pretty well covered. They're huge glasses. She's got a handkerchief and she's got a hand. So nearly three quarters of her face is covered up. She's always happy. Bubbly, you know, love playing, you know, just like any kid would. Right there. Now, he said loved. She loved to play. That's past tense. If she is still alive, you would expect a parent to say she loves to play. So often when people change tenses, that's a, a major red flag. Just hope that she's found as soon as possible. Deceptive people will create distance and uh, disassociation. Not once do I hear uh, him use her name, and he'll say things like, I hope she, and that's creating distance. I'd expect uh, a heartfelt plea or emotion using or uh, taking ownership and using her name, but I don't see that. In the days ahead, finding the six-year-old becomes a community crusade, a tribute that starts with a few of Kaisha's treasures outside her home grows to become a huge symbol of hope for her safe return. The only ones not searching are the two who've known the six-year-old's fate all along. Neither of them, you know, made any effort to go and have a look themselves. They didn't, uh, on day three that Kaisha was missing, um, were sitting out the back having a drink. They just carried on like um, a normal life. You know, she'd go out, get her hair done, get her nails done, go out, get Maccas and stuff like that, go shopping and things like that, you know. By this time, Abrahams and Smith are moved to a local motel. With the couple gone, forensic teams scour the unit, finding traces of Kaisha's blood in every room. It's the crucial evidence they need. Would there be any reason why there'd be more blood, not just in her unit, but throughout the unit? What are you trying to say? I'm just saying that when we forensically examined the unit, there's a, there's a amount of Kaisha's blood throughout the unit. And I'm just trying to ask you, know. ask you how that would have got there. I don't know. Now, there's two things. She was defensive both verbally and also uh, uh, physically with her body language. It's not the sort of behaviour you would expect from a parent where the police are actually trying to help you find your child. We're just trying to get to the bottom of this. You're very angry. Yeah, well. And us. We're going to get to the bottom of what's happened to her. Yeah, and okay. I hope you do because, mate, I need to know. I think everybody needs to know. So what are you trying to say, that we did something to her? Or I didn't say that. 
in these type of interviews, it's a battle. Um, she wants to know what the police know, and of course the police want to know what she wants to know. So she's actually testing the water. So she's saying to them, are you on to me, really, isn't she? Well, she and yeah. she looks concerned. Yeah, she looks very concerned. The New South Wales police were never fooled by Christy Abraham's crocodile tears. Piece by piece, they methodically gathered evidence. And finally, eight months after that deceitful appeal, Abraham's confessed to the terrible crime. And within hours, detectives found Kaisha's body at a remote bush grave on what would have been her seventh birthday. It was Good Friday when the police officer came knocking at my door at two o'clock and told me that they had just arrested Christian Robbs with Kaisha's murder. I think I spent about 24 hours crying. Why'd she have to kill Kaisha? Abrahams is serving 16 years jail for Kaisha's murder, Smith 12 years. Coming up on Inside Story. I haven't harmed my wife or my daughter. Truth and lies. I haven't harmed either of them. How to pick a killer. Crocodile tears. <laughs> That's what I thought Did immediately. You? Lindy Chamberlain. Joanne Lees. Kate and Jerry McCann. Tom Ma. All centre stage in some of the biggest crime stories of our times. Who can forget their impassioned pleas? Please, if you have Madeline, let her come home to her mummy, daddy, brother and sister. But secretly, many of us thought the worst, even though we were proven terribly wrong. Admit it, it did cross your mind. Maybe it wasn't the dingo that took baby Azaria. For someone who'd just lost their youngest child, Lindy was showing all the wrong signs. If you've ever seen a dingo eat, there's, there's no difficulty at all because you watch them eat the carcass of a cow or something like that. They never eat the skin. They use their feet like hands and pull back the skin as they go and they'll just peel it like an orange. Then there's British backpacker Joanne Lees. Perhaps she did have something to do with the strange outback disappearance of her boyfriend Peter Falconio. I hope that people will respect now my privacy and allow me to get on with my life. And the McCanns. Yes, there were tears, but something didn't add up about the disappearance of their daughter, Madeline. We have played no part in the disappearance of our lovely daughter, Madeline. We even jumped to conclusions when Tom Ma made this public appeal about the disappearance of his then missing wife, Jill. Just, just uh, hoping that something turns up. In many of these high profile cases, uh, w why did we think that they were guilty? A lot of people determine that they may have been guilty because of their lack of emotion. But what we need to do as investigators is to look at all the other evidence holistically rather than just rely on uh, you know, their emotional responses. So how often do people, ordinary people, get it right? Well, research shows that we're not very good at spotting a lie. We're accurate around about between 50 and 52% of the time, which is equal to chance. So it's just a flip of the coin. And being influenced by the personality, uh, because we had preconceived ideas, we believe what we hear, uh, and we're influenced by the personality themselves. That's what's so strange, isn't it? We've got innocent people here that we're pointing the finger at, and then these killers convincing people that they're innocent. Trying to convince that they're innocent, yeah. Um, it, it's one of those things that um, if you're a suspect for a homicide, uh, you have to play that role. You have to live through that charade. And of course, uh, if you start um, you know, not helping the authorities or contradicting your story, well then you, you eventually get caught out. I'm speaking today to make a national appeal to Anna. Certainly, the jury was out on John Sharp's performance as he made this public appeal for pregnant wife Anna and baby Gracie. Our marriage may be over, but I still love you. As you are the mother of our beautiful daughter Gracie, 
We meet both the door more than anyone else. The former bank clerk claims she's run off with another man, but that's a terrible lie. He slaughtered her and their baby daughter with a spear gun. I haven't harmed my wife or my daughter. I haven't harmed either of them. To me, he is not convincing at all. I would doubt him right from the start. Yeah, absolutely. When I first saw those tapes, there were a number of uh, inconsistencies. Number one is he made mention of the fact that he was worried that police were making inquiries into the disappearance of his wife and daughter. Now, one would expect that is exactly what the police would do in that role. Um, so why is he concerned about that? I think that he was more concerned about him being detected for his crime because he knew what happened to them because he was involved in their murder. John and Anna Sharp lived at Mornington on Melbourne's Port Phillip Bay with their 19-month-old daughter, Gracie. They seemed very happy. They enjoyed their lives together. Dawn Hendry was best friends with Anna Sharp. She was always doing stuff for him and, yeah, she seemed, as she described him, was good husband material and she was happy. <laughs> and he was a bit quieter. Yes, he was very reserved, very quiet. Didn't open up a lot. It took a lot to, to open up. I mean, he's one of six children, so maybe he just... That's part of being <laughs> one of six children, so... But he seemed, he seemed nice, nothing untoward that I would have ever known his name. But when Anna announces she's pregnant again, her husband is enraged. She said he actually yelled at her. She goes, oh, I'll give, you know, things might change as the pregnancy grows and maybe it's just a shock. And Anna was thrilled that she was going to have a baby boy. Yes, yeah, she was. Because she thought, ah, oh, baby boy. Because she wanted one of each if she could get it. So she was excited. Anna never has that second child. John Sharp buys a high-powered spear gun from the local sports store and learns how to use it in the backyard. Then one night, while his wife is asleep, he fires two deadly barbs into her head, killing Anna and her unborn baby. Nobody deserves to be treated like that. She was a human, she was a mother. She was gonna be a mother again. I mean, that baby as well died the instant he did that as well. But even more shocking, four days later, Sharp uses that same spear gun to kill his daughter, Gracie. To stand there and, and shoot your own child, and not just once, the fact that Gracie was screaming after he shot her the first time. It's just, it's heartbreaking to think that that poor child, her last memories of life, she was screaming because her dad was hurting her. How could you do that to your own flesh and blood? So why would a person murder two people so close to him in such an horrific way. He has a socially sort of ineffective personality and he, he felt that his wife was dominating him but rather than expressing that to her he, he would swallow that and simmer upon it and he convinced himself, he talked himself into to killing her. The, the reason he killed his daughter though was because he, he wanted to get away with killing his wife and nobody would believe that his wife would abandon their little girl, so he he killed her in order to, to escape punishment himself. Why would he have chosen a spear gun as the murder weapon? It seems particularly brutal. Barbaric, it, it does, and it, it's difficult to understand why and, and not very bright of him either when um, records could be traced about how he bought it. It's some weeks before John Sharp makes the first of several appeals and suspicions are aroused immediately. If they could just come forward and even if you don't ring me, just the media or police or her family. When you saw the appeals that he made publicly, how did you react? Crocodile tears, <laughs> that's what I thought did immediately. You? Why do you say crocodile tears? Um, they just seemed fake. He didn't seem to be really upset. I said at the time to my husband that I don't believe it. He's just lying, it's just not right. He's just lying. He's had something to do with it. He was playing the role of a very distraught husband and, and father. Was he looking for sympathy? Yeah, he was trying to, again, manipulate the media and pass himself off as the victim that his wife had walked out on him. So even in death, he made her look like a bad person. 
Anna, our marriage may be over, but I still love you, as you are the mother of our beautiful daughter, Gracie, whom we both adore more than anyone else. But police weren't fooled. They knew they had their killer. They took Sharp in for questioning, and eventually he broke down and confessed, telling them where he'd dumped Anna and Gracie's bodies. Ultimately, John Sharp was sentenced to life imprisonment. How bad was he? I think he's evil. To be clinically sane, to shoot your wife, to just cover her face and go sleep on the couch, then to bury her, then later on dig her up, cut her up, and dump her in the trash. No sane person could do that. Even an insane person couldn't do that. He was cold and calculating. He's evil. He really is an evil person. Still to come on Inside Story. As soon as a cow bitch. He had a wife, a mistress, and 18 kids. You probably don't <laughs> like it. You can get Bizarre life and gruesome death in the Philpot family. At first, Mick Philpot seemed like a real character. Weird, yes, but harmless. There was a wife, a mistress, and a tribe of children. But deep inside Mick Philpot, there was a rage, a madness that would have terrifying consequences. And then, is it not true that on alternate nights, um, wife number one comes to spend the night in the caravan, and then the next night, wife number two comes to oh, spend yeah, the night? Oh, yeah, it's great. Great lifestyle. Yeah. Television put Mick Philpot in the spotlight. He loved being in front of the cameras, and it would make him a minor celebrity. But television would also be his downfall. The cameras caught him out. This is my wife, Mairead. Hello, Mairead. This is going to sound strange. This is my second wife, Lisa. It all begins with Mick Philpot's unusual family life. Shameless Mick, as he's known, lives with his wife and his mistress. They have 18 children, all paid for by government benefits. Jane and Carla, baby number 17. And this one here is Yari, baby number 18. And I'll tell you what, if the public don't like it, you can get Philpot even stars in a documentary at the height of his notoriety, joking about his bizarre setup to host Anne Widdicombe. I mean, I'm sleeping here all the time, and the girls taking turns in here with me. I have one one night, one another night. It's a nice routine. Yeah, I mean, it might be strange to you, but yeah, it's a great arrangement. To sum up his attitude towards those women, he said to me, and these were his words, he said, the women take it in turns to come here, he said, and one night I service one and one the next. He didn't say, make love, sus, was the word he used as if he was speaking about a cow in a field. I mean, it was absolutely horrible. But there is also a much darker side to Mick Philpot that is quick to surface. What? Right, just switch it off and listen. Don't work. I, I, I am Get working. a job. I'm looking after my Get kids. Get a job. Listen, this shows you what a bitch Get you are, don't it? Get a job. You, useless, you are. Yeah, Seriously. yeah, yeah. You're yeah. like the rest. Talk yeah. to that because you're not working. I work, mate. Mind. There was a pent-up aggression in him, and he would address women, uh, including, including his wife and his mistress, as bitch. Every bitch out there who's got children at home yep. and are not working. It's a menacing glimpse of just what Mick Philpot is capable of. When I challenged him on that, um, he got really very aggressive about it. I am ashamed. You should be ashamed. I am ashamed, being at home. You're a coward. As soon as a coward, bitch. Let's f***ing move it. Philpott's unconventional family life is a sham. Live-in mistress Lisa eventually decides she's had enough and leaves, taking her five children with her. Mick Philpott was desperate to get the kids back. Without them, he was losing valuable child welfare payments. So, in a bizarre plot, he decided to set fire to his house and blame it on Lisa. The thinking was, with Lisa's reputation ruined, he could win custody of the children. But the plan was as deadly as it was deranged. 
Have you had Charles Times? <laughs> yeah, we've got some we've got the police on the way. Have you any idea what's caused the fire? <laughs> but of course, Philpot knows exactly how it started. With the help of wife Mairead and best friend Paul Mosley, petrol is poured at the bottom of the stairs and set alight. When I got to the house, there was no front door. It was just a wall of fire. Neighbours Darren and Jamie Butler are among the first on the scene. I just thought, there's kids in the house. I was like, where's the kids, where's the kids? In the bedrooms, in the bedrooms. And I tried to climb up the ladder. That didn't work. Couldn't get in. The children have no chance. Open windows on the ground and first floor mean the stairwell acts like a chimney, fanning the flames and sucking toxic smoke into the children's bedrooms. <laughs> what Philpot intends to be a small fire erupts into an inferno. It's the worst thing I've seen in my life. To see six little babies coming out. Destroy me. It's killed me. As the sheer horror of the fire unfolds, Jamie and Darren are finding it more and more difficult to understand Philpot's behaviour. No reaction. There's no emotion or nothing. That was wrong in every way, but I didn't realise it at the time. It was only after I stood back and looked at the bigger picture that that was wrong. But in the public's eyes, this is a terrible tragedy. And at first, Philpott's evil plan appears to be working. I can confirm that a woman in her late 20s has been arrested on suspicion of murder in connection with this case. That woman is Philpott's estranged mistress, Lisa Willis. I never believed that. Um, when it was said that she'd been arrested, I thought, hang on, you know, I don't see this somehow. Next, how shameless Mick's arrogance brings him unstuck. I just cannot believe it. It's an act. It's just an act. It is one of the most bizarre appeals of all time. Mick Philpott calling his own news conference thinking he can duke the public as well as the police over the deaths of his six children. I've actually been down to my, our, our home and what we saw, we just, we just cannot believe it. By now, police have questioned Philpott's mistress Lisa and released her without charge. They know the fire that killed the six children has been deliberately lit and they are already beginning to suspect Philpott himself. What I saw was a guy who came in and bounced into the room to receive a briefing from me in a rather excited state, relishing, I thought, the prospect of going out in front of the TV cameras. I didn't believe that he was genuinely overcome with grief and emotion. Uh, I thought he was playing to the cameras. What we're seeing here is um, he's actually dabbing dry eyes. Um, no tears, so why is he using a handkerchief to dab something that's not occurring? We decided that through our son Dwayne, we're going to donate his, his organs to save another child. It's interesting, his wife is uh, really not taking any part in the, the conference at all. Usually I uh, expect uh, mothers to explain or tell them what they felt about their, their child or children. Um, they'll often talk about them as if they're still there. Um, they will hold on to memories, they will show photos because um, there's those emotions attached, but um, I just see avoidance. <laughs> It's an act. It's just an act. It's theatrical. Um, it's not even convincing or believable. So on a scale of, of these kind of appeals, where would you put Mick Philpot? I had a ten, not even a one. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. He wasn't crying, there was no tears. It, you could see it was just fake. 
From the outset, Mairead's sisters, Jennifer and Bernadette, suspect foul play. Philpott's sickening behaviour at the morgue as he's identifying his dead children, all but confirming their fears. Like an animal. A complete animal. With no consideration for the poor children. None whatsoever. He was up there having a laugh and a joke with, you know, two other female women. And just caressing the breasts. Just as appalling, Philpot and his wife openly spend the $25,000 raised by the grieving community for the children's funeral. Any money that got passed to Mick and Maraid in their hands never went towards the children's funerals. It was spent on expensive clothing for the older kids. It was spent on expensive meals, days out. Not a penny of it went towards the children's funerals. In the fortnight after the fire, police put the Philpots up in a motel and, all the while, they are recording everything they say. What did you say? Tell me what you said to me. What did you say about how many times you went up ladders? I can't ask how many times you went up ladders. What did you say about me trying to get in? You tried everything you could to get in. Like I said to him, I wanted to run through the flames. Up the stairs. What did you cry when you were saying it? How bad? Not really, really bad, but I did cry. By now, forensic experts also have solid physical evidence. Petrol is found on the clothes of the Philpots and their accomplice, Paul Mosley. There are also traces in the Philpots' kitchen sink. It was straight petrol which set that fire. Uh, and I think that discredited Mick Philpott's account completely and utterly. It seems almost all of Derby turns out for the funeral of the Philpot children. All except Mick and Mairead Philpot. Murderer! They are under arrest for their murder. This morning at 10am we arrested a 55 year old man and a 31 year old woman in the city centre of Derby. True to form, the remorseless Mick Philpot has little concern for his children's fate. He's more worried about his own skin. Even as he and Mairead are being taken to court, he is still trying to ensure his wife sticks to their terrible lie. Come on, sweet pea. Come on, no, no, no. Come on, no, something. Have they got any evidence on you? They've got nothing on me. Nothing. But the truth is, they have plenty on Mick Philpot. You couldn't get out of it. No, of course he couldn't. You couldn't get out of it. Come no. on. Philpot is sent to jail for life. Mairead and their accomplice Paul Mosley get 17 years each. It's quite hard to listen to, to your own sister talk and discuss what they've done. You know, and then, and then seeing their reactions after. They had no... They, felt, they mustn't have felt anything for them kids because, you know, the disrespect we showed them after they died, after what they'd done, was disgusting, and that's unforgivable. Coming up next... Was he insane? He definitely wasn't insane. Inside the mind of the cold-blooded killer. He knew what he was doing. Just let someone know you're all right, please. Just call someone and just say you're OK. Anyone. What's so hard to fathom about all the cases we've seen tonight is their sheer brutality. How could the killers remain so detached from their shocking crimes? You'd think they'd have to be insane, but the truth is not so black and white. I'm speaking today to make a national appeal to Anna. John Sharp spear gunned his wife and baby daughter to death. He wasn't just bad, he was plain evil. But was he mad? How do you explain a killer like that? Was he insane? He definitely wasn't insane. And that's something that's hard for people to wrap their minds around how someone could do something like that. 
but the psych assessments that were done before his sentencing showed there was no evidence of psychosis or delusions. And you can see that with the way that he premeditatedly buys the spear gun, he practices using it, and then the calculated way he goes about trying to cover up the crime. There's no thought disorder, there's no insanity at all. He knew what he was doing. Besides being my hero and role model, he was my mentor. Seth Gonzalez's crimes were just as brutal and calculated as those of John Sharp, yet he was also sane. He was lying here with his, on his back and his head was, um, head was in, this, in, this, in, in that area. In a frenzied attack, he stabbed his sister, mother and father to death, calmly disposed of the murder weapons and then went out to a nightclub. This was the emergency call he made when he returned home. <laughs> Why were the murders carried out in such a brutal way? He was furious with his parents for controlling him and that's why he attacked them so viciously. We'd like to ask anyone out there to please help us. Then came his elaborate cover-up, the public displays of grief, the alibis and false leads. Sorry, I never told you All I wanted to say How did Seth Gonzalez think that he could fool everyone? He lived in a fantasy world where he was the king and rolling around in the, the Mac Daddy car with his inheritance, thinking that he was going to, you know, triumph. Gonzalez is sentenced to life in prison. He's found to be a self-obsessed, compulsive liar who hated his parents. They were successful Filipino migrants and wanted their son to succeed as well. But when he began failing at university, the pressure became all too much. He'd been faking his grades. His girlfriend had left him. His car was going to be taken away from him. And this was an insult to his self-esteem. And people with a narcissistic personality don't tolerate that very well. Any humiliation or defeat that they feel, they turn inside to rage and they fantasise upon how they're going to get their own back. I've actually been down to my our, our home and what we saw, we just, we just cannot believe it. In Mick Philpott's case, he was mad, a classic psychopath who craved attention and demanded absolute control. He'd lived a parasitic lifestyle typical of a psychopath and when somebody puts a, a blockage in the way of the goals of a psychopath then they get frustrated, they act impulsively and they don't care about the consequences. So the, the thoughts about looking after his children weren't even there. So he didn't love his children? A true psychopath, and I believe that's what, he, what Mick Philpott was, um, doesn't love anybody. They have no empathy, they can't emotionally connect with anybody, they see the world as their personal vending machine and they take what they want when they want it. In Christy Abraham's case, the warning signs were there all along. The self-loathing, the rage. Why would Christy Abraham's hurt her helpless little girl? She has two types of personality disorders and the first is a borderline personality disorder which is characterised by inappropriate rage outbursts, anger outbursts. She had also the second personality disorder, antisocial personality disorder which relates to having a, a reckless disregard for the safety of others, even her own little girl and lack of remorse when she puts her through this torture. Um, she really doesn't care about it at all. Given her state of mind, it was perhaps only a matter of time before the woman who Kaisha trusted in all her innocence committed the most unspeakable of crimes and then the ultimate deceit. She is beautiful. <laughs> it's hard to know whether Christy Abraham set out that night to kill her, but uh, certainly the amount of attacks that she'd inflicted upon her daughter um, were escalating and leading up to something like this. She was taking out her inner rage of frustrations on a helpless little girl. Cherished daughter and granddaughter, you're not just a memory or part of our past. You're part of our family as long as last. She won't be forgotten, will she? She will never be forgotten. 
too young to be taken away. Rest in peace, sweetheart. Nini Lavisha. That's about it for tonight, but before we go, Tom Steinfurt's here to tell us about one of the most chilling videos you're ever likely to see. Yeah, Layla, this guy was dubbed the Facebook killer after an online friendship resulted in not one but two young women being murdered. However, it's his cold and remorseless on-camera confession that'll really leave you speechless. How many times do you think you hit her with the ex? At least several, seven times. Beyond sickening, it's unforgivable. Stabbed her a couple of times in the throat. That's the last time that we saw her. He's just an animal. You don't think you'll ever walk through life meeting a killer, but that's what we've done. That is next week's Inside Story. I'm Layla McKinnon. I hope you can join us then.